Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. My parents, as some of you know, and as Cantor Feldman knows, hail from the United Kingdom. My father from Glasgow, Scotland, and my mother from Manchester, England. And though they've lived in America for many years, raising four American boys, were you to meet my mother, I think we'd agree, you'd think that you were speaking to a properly, proper English lady recently arrived on American shores. In order to understand the rest of the story, you need to understand one other thing about my parents, that my father absolutely hates turkey. I'll never forget one year growing up when my father, having suffered through too many Thanksgiving turkeys, finally prevailed upon my mother that a bird is a bird is a bird. And wouldn't Thanksgiving be that much more enjoyable if he could substitute chicken for the turkey at the traditional Thanksgiving meal? It was a day that will forever live in infamy. The Cosgrove family gathering around at the Thanksgiving table and what comes out? We sit down for Cornish hens. A combination of horror and loathing at such a turn of events and undoubtedly deep, deep shame. Four young, impressionable American boys incredulous at this treasonous act of our foreign-born parents to add insult to injury could not even understand the embarrassment we were feeling. What sort of person does such a thing? A Thanksgiving chicken. It's a childhood trauma that decades later continues to haunt me. Only today can I speak about it publicly. <laughs> Tradition is a powerful thing. The rituals we observe, the melodies we sing, the customs we pass down, some occasional, some intermittent, rituals are the language that shape our identities as individuals and as communities. We pass them down from generation to generation, knowing that in those traditions, we're connected to something much bigger than our individual selves. Jewish holidays, if nothing else, are jam-packed repositories for rituals and traditions, the shofar blasts, the Hanukkah lights. Each time we experience them, the substratum of our identities are activated. We recall past holidays, and we anticipate future ones. And no traditions elicit more of a visceral response than those surrounding food, be it apples and honey, a bowl of Shabbos chicken soup, or a Thanksgiving turkey. We take those traditions very seriously, and we get very, very upset when someone messes with them. It's not at all logical. Why a turkey and not a chicken? or other rituals. Why sing take me out to the ball game in the seventh inning instead of the sixth? The questions themselves are off-putting, if not offensive. When it comes to ritual, there's only one answer. <coughs> because, because this is the way I received it. This is the way I do it, and this is the only way it should be done. When it comes to rituals, logic has nothing to do with it. The answer is in our kishkas. This is the way it should be. This time next week, Passover will have begun and the Jewish people will be one day into our eight-day carb-filled anti-juice cleanse festival of matzah. More than any other festival, Passover is a holiday about tradition, the ritualized recitation of the Haggadah, the foods we eat, the foods we don't eat, what we say and who says what, when, at the table. Even the most secular soul will try to find his or her way to a Seder. Even the most non-observant Jew will abstain from eating leavened bread. All of which is why this year I want to speak to you carefully about a major change in the laws of Passover as ratified by the conservative movement this past fall, a change that could potentially cause a dramatic rethinking of our Passover traditions 
this coming week and the week to come, years to come. To begin with the basics, we are all well familiar with the mitzvah of eating matzah and the prohibition of eating chametz. According to the sources, the five things designated as chametz and interestingly also matzah are wheat, barley, spelt, oats, and rye. And we also know that within the Jewish world, there exists a split between the Sephardic and the Ashkenazic Eastern European Jews on the subject of legumes. In Hebrew, the word is kitniot, corn, soybeans, rice, peanuts, and otherwise. While eaten heartily, these things in the Sephardic community, these foods, none of which, interestingly, are one of the five ingredients of chametz, are not to be eaten by Ashkenazi Jews. For me growing up, as I'm sure for many of you, it would have been inconceivable to see a bowl of rice or a lentil dish over Passover. And this has been the state of affairs that stood as tradition for some 700 years. Last November, Rabbis Amy Levin and Israel Reisner submitted a tshuva, a rabbinic responsa, or position paper, subsequently approved by the Conservative Movement's Committee on Jewish Law and Standards, overturning the Ashkenazic prohibition of kitniot on Pesach. Building on an earlier paper written by my teacher, Rabbi David Galinkin, they demonstrate rather conclusively that this prohibition is utterly baseless in the Jewish sources. It's not until the 13th century France, relatively late in the span of Jewish law, that we hear of this prohibition, a prohibition for which there's no explanation given. So puzzled have the rabbis been over the ages at this Ashkenazi law against Kitniot that over a dozen post facto explanations have been proffered, including the fear that they can be confused or mixed in together with the ingredients of chametz. If anything, Rabbis Levin and Galinkin and Reisner demonstrate the desire of the rabbinic authorities for hundreds of years to overturn this prohibition lacking any justification whatsoever. So having established the log shaky logic at hand, Rabbi Reisner and Levin provide a long list of reasons why this prohibition should be reconsidered. Age-old fears of mixing wheat and kitniot are not really the case when ordering your food from Fresh Direct. The inflated pricing of Passover foods could be mitigated by offering a host of other culinary options. To those who are vegetarian or gluten-free, the opportunity to partake in other forms of protein will undoubtedly enhance the joy of the festive season. Somewhat more philosophically minded, they argue, to perpetuate a baseless custom is to cause people to scoff at the enterprise of Jewish law altogether. After all, if Jews are being asked to observe a law empty of logic, how can they be expected to take any of Jewish law seriously? Furthermore, for a people so small that places such a premium on unity, why prolong this custom that divides the Jewish people into separate ethnic enclaves? Perhaps most of all, as a movement of tradition and change, are we not, one could argue, the very movement to insist on the ongoing development of Jewish law. So summing up their arguments, their paper concludes, in order to bring down the cost of making Passover and support the healthier diet that's now more common, and given the inapplicability today of the primary concerns that seem to have led to the custom of prohibiting kitniot, and further given our inclination in our day, present an accessible Judaism unencumbered by unneeded prohibitions, more easily able to participate in the culture that surrounds us, we are prepared to rely on the fundamental observance recorded in the Talmud and codes and permit the eating of kitniot on Pesach. One small step for edamame, <laughs> one giant leap for the Jewish people. It may not be a papal encyclical, but for those of you who, like me, have lived our whole lives not eating kitniot, this is big news. 
opening up a world of new culinary possibilities in our upcoming festival. Maybe. Because it's at this juncture that our old friend tradition enters the room. To be clear, there's nothing about this responsa, this chuva, that forces you or any Jew to change his or her practice. It's merely opening up a possibility that hitherto didn't exist before. Furthermore, a dissenting opinion submitted by rabbis Friedman, Cole, Hoffman, Bickart, and our own former rabbi, Miriam Berkowitz, argues that Ashkenazi tradition should continue to stand. We have, to use the Hebrew expression, min ha-gavotenu be'yadenu, a tradition of our predecessors in our hands. Nobody disputes the fact that the rationale for this prohibition is very weak. But then again, anyone with a passing knowledge of Jewish observance knows that the rationale for a lot of things we do isn't always strong. Why chickens can't be eaten with dairy? Why one waits between eating meat and milk but not milk to meat? Why porcelain dishes can't be koshered? Logic has nothing to do with the power of tradition. Were we to do away with all of the Jewish laws that don't make sense, our ritual lives would be rather impoverished. As conservative Jews, we believe in legal development. Of course we do. But we don't do so willy-nilly. We do so, or more precise, I do so, when I believe that a Jewish law diminishes the dignity or humanity of another, human, another being, for example, in matters of gender or sexuality. I do so when I believe that the presence of a tradition is an impediment to Jews from engaging in Jewish life and living. Case in point, the fact that we live stream our services or add musical instrumentation or we press the envelope on outreach to those who would join our faith. I do so when advances in science prompt us to reconsider long-standing customs, case in point, the permissibility of organ transplantation, in vitro fertilization, or for that matter, whether swordfish is or isn't kosher. There are many reasons to change Jewish law. And I think anyone who has observed my rabbinate would be safe to put me in the progressive camp of our movement. But as a dissenting opinion states, in the matter of the prohibition on kitniot, we do not see such a compelling reason in this case. Unfounded as it is, the prohibition has taken on the force of law. Whatever schism it creates in the Jewish community, to change it creates a rupture in Jewish history and within the contemporary Ashkenazic community. Yes, if for health reasons or dietary reasons, one must eat kitniot if you're a vegan or you need your soy milk, by all means, do so. But that's no different than any other leniency when health and well-being is concerned. Here on the Upper East Side, it's difficult to conjure up the financial argument, though there too, if sincere, I would of course side on leniency. Best that I can tell, the prohibition does not raise any ethical objections save the hurt feelings of a few legumes. On the subject of what is and what isn't chametz, we are in possession of no information that was not already known in the 13th century. And as to the question of whether this prohibition is an impediment to Jewish identity formation, quite frankly, it's difficult for me to conjure the argument that but for this prohibition on kitniot, just imagine how robust the Jewish world would be. <laughs> there are many changes, far more controversial to Jewish law proposed over the years by the conservative movement, and there will be, mark my words, please God, many to come. But to change, or as Mishnah Brachot teaches, to break Jewish law is an act that should only be taken in order to serve and preserve the Jewish future. 
For me, this debate is not about kitniot. It's about kishkas. And at the end of the day, I am my mother's son. If you are making me choose between kitniot and my kishkas, I choose kishkas any day of the year and twice on Passover. So where does this leave us? As members of this conservative synagogue, this Passover, as a private Jew, you may, if you so choose, eat kitniot. As rabbi of this synagogue, despite the recent ruling of the Committee on Jewish Law and Standards, the policy of the synagogue remains unchanged. No kitniot allowed. As far as the Cosgrove of household goes, to the degree that I have any authority there, <laughs> there will be no edamame, no rice, no beans, or otherwise this Passover. More than any other holiday, Passover calls on us to join community, to return to our heritage, to heal the bonds of Jewish identity that have slackened and frayed over time. This is our high season for ritual, for religion, for peoplehood, and for tradition. May we see ourselves this Pesach as threads in the eternal tapestry of our people, and may each and every one of you have a healthy, a happy, and a kosher Pesach. Shabbat Shalom.